Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I am Udayan Mukherjee. India is a large market for alcoholic beverages, but unlike its counterparts in the western world, it's a market dominated largely by spirits. Low alcoholic beverages or low percentage alcohol content beverages like wines and beers don't get much of a look in. But that may be about to change and one company which has been trying its best over the last decade and more to change drinking habits in India and to further the culture of wine drinking is Sula Vineyards and therefore it gives me great pleasure to welcome on the show today Rajiv Samant managing director and CEO of Sula but Rajiv thanks for joining in and great to have you on the show today Absolutely Udayan a pleasure thank you very much uh, I want to start by asking you whether you are a wine person yourself or are you a, are you a lover of spirits like most Indians I'm very much a wine person but uh, that doesn't preclude me from uh, enjoying a spirit from time to time so I do enjoy a, a gin and tonic for example from time to time but if you ask me what my go to drink is generally it's a glass of well made sula white wine okay white over red uh, but you know as I said in my introduction Rajiv you know the wine despite the strides that you've made over the last decade or so and more wine is still what 1% of the 33 billion dollar spirits market uh, is it changing at all or is it changing at a glacial pace so you're very right that it's a it's a fraction of the uh, spirit market in india india has had a tradition ever since india started drinking uh, which was really during the british raj um, the brits were uh, great fans of spirits and therefore india became a spirits drinking country until this point you know it's very interesting that if you look at those countries that were under the french colonial rule they became wine drinking countries so you know some people say that uh, oh but don't indians prefer spirits and um, you know it's not anything intrinsic it's just a fact of of some of our not so far back uh, history however that's changing i would not say at a glacial pace i would say uh, fairly rapidly uh, over the last decade wine has been growing much faster than spirits and beer and that growth continues today so i think it's a very uh, you know we are very optimistic about the road ahead hmm. is it only changing in a few metros and big cities or do you see a nationwide kind of a consumer preference shift uh, going on rajiv you definitely see it being led by the metros and big cities having said that you know you got to think about where it started when it started it was only uh, mumbai and delhi then it moved to bangalore today it's in hyderabad it's it's in it's in chennai it's in kolkata um goa is a booming market gurgaon is a booming market so um though yes it is still the big cities it's moving also very fast to some of the of the uh, tier 2 cities um in fact over this past uh, couple of years we've seen faster growth if anything in the tier 2 cities than in the metros you have any numbers you can throw at me in terms of targets by say in the next 5 or 10 years what percentage of the indian market spirit uh, alcohol market could actually be wines when does it co- cross 5% of the entire alcoholic beverages market so at this point you know i would say even if we double over the next 5 uh, years you're still looking at just about 2% so 5% is fairly far in the future but let's understand what that means you know india is uh, one of the largest a uh, volume markets in terms of spirits in the world um and rapidly also in terms of value becoming one of the most important if you think about the spirit majors um india is um, generally in the top 5 markets for the spirit majors so it's a very significant market so i would say at this point even if we capture 2% of the market that would still mean that uh, we at sula would have to something like uh, produce two and a half to three times the uh, volume of wine that we are producing today so we have our work cut out for us for the next 10 15 years ahead even to get to 2% mm. now as this market doubles when whether in the next 4 years or 6 years uh, do you think the entrenched leaders like sula would be disproportionate beneficiaries because wine is an interesting market in that there are some entry barriers i mean you can't just a uh, flip a coin and get access to vineyards most of the lo- vineyards are tied into very long term 10 year 12 year contract so a new entrant cannot just walk in and start producing or have access to wine so do you stand to benefit disproportionately if the market were to take off udayan you have hit the nail on the head um 
I wouldn't say we'll benefit disproportionately. Even today, um, as you're probably very well aware, Sula has something like 60 to 65 percent of the premium wine market. So, you know, we are already uh, very much the, the leaders in the market. And I think we're going to continue to be the leaders in the market. As you said, extremely difficult for a new entrant to come up, even to persuade farmers to plant for you. You know, they always say, show us first. Sula today has a track record, 25 years of working with farmers successfully, and that stands for a lot. So there is a very wide and deep moat towards more players uh, entering this space, and we definitely have it sewn up. Of course, we've proven that it's not only that we, we have market share, but we've always executed and stayed ahead of the field, been pioneers in so many ways. We'll have to continue doing that. We aim to continue doing that. So we aim to continue being uh, market leaders for, for quite a while in the future. Mm. Uh, so forget new entrants. What about existing competition? Like you are the dominant player, but there are pe uh, players like Fratelli and Grover Zampa who are not exactly tiny. But do you see the market shares between the top three players changing significantly at all uh, in the next two or three years or three or four years? What I would like to see is for the overall pie to grow. I think today for Sula, that's the most important thing and for all of us, uh, because, you know, uh, sort of squ squabbling amongst ourselves for a market share of a market that is not that large, I think would be uh, very short sighted compared to working together, which is something that we are doing, coming on common platforms or taking part in uh, in wine shows together, taking part in things like Little Flea in Mumbai together. Uh, so coming together to try to grow this market that at this point is is barely 1% of Alcobev, take it to 2%, 2.5% together, I think that would be a great thing to do. So I'm not really looking necessarily for us to take more market share. We've already, we're in a place that we are so dominant. I'm looking uh, rather to take wine to tier two cities and beyond. Right now, tier three, it's probably a little bit early to talk about it, but definitely tier two. I mean, just think about how huge that market is and how much work we have ahead of that, uh, ahead of us for that. Plus, wine is an agricultural crop. So as you've just said, you know, 10 year contracts, you need to plant today. You only get your grapes three years from now. It's not easy just to produce on demand. So, you know, Market shares are sticky, but we hope to grow the whole, the entire market together. Well, market shares are sticky because we are talking only about domestic players, Rajiv. And that's the only uh, kind of criticism one can level against uh, the kind of work that domestic wine players, manufacturers like Sula have been doing, which is commendable in other senses uh, over the last decade or more. Uh, is that in a sense, you're, you can be called a child of duty protection because you're competing with local wines, but international wines have to pay 150% duty. If they were allowed in, like many countries do, would you be able to flourish in the face of imported competition? So I do believe that our government has a um, you know very well thought out strategy in this case. Uh, I would not like to single out wine uh, and the wine industry as sort of children of uh, protection. Please remember that at the end of the day, this is one of the bright, few bright spots for Indian agriculture. Today, you have a thriving wine scene. You have so many more uh, grape growers joining, starting to plant wine grapes. How many bright spots do you have in Indian agriculture? And so this is something that's definitely something. It's a farmer's story. Once you talk about duties, you have the same duties exactly on spirits. You have the same duties on beers. You know, you have things like automobiles that are protected by those kinds of tariffs. So, you know, it would be quite unfair to single out uh, Indian wine in this case. If you talk about beer, which is far bigger than Indian wine, there's basically no imported beer in the market. Now, what's happened as a result is that a lot of big players have come in and invested in India and breweries here. I think that's the kind of thing that uh, India would like to see happen. We have a 100% automatic FDI in wine today. And, you know, I think we, we invite other big wine players to come up and make wine here. There's so much land. There's one lakh hectares of table grapes in Maharashtra and barely a couple thousand hectares of wine grapes. So you can tell the immense potential. Let's make wine here in India and let's be proud about it. Uh, on the subject, Rajiv, I believe that India is uh, re-looking at its trade terms with Australia in terms of import of wine. And over a 
graded phasing of many years, maybe the duties will come down. How could it potentially affect a player like you? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of a situation where maybe a Jacob's Creek, which is a mass market Australian wine, retails at eight or nine hundred rupees in in uh, in Delhi. Would Sula be able to compete with that? Would it could it ever happen? So over there, and we should remember that actually an FTA or an early harvest has already been signed with Australia. Duties are going to come down on some of the more expensive um, Australian wines. I think again, the Indian government has been uh, you know a very uh, far thinking about this in that they have uh, agreed with the Australian government that duty should come down on more expensive wines. But given, I mean, Udayan, I don't know if you, you have um, any uh, data on how much uh, uh, benefits and subsidies some of these other grape growing um, and winemaking countries get from their governments as opposed to India, where we, we don't have any basically uh, from the central government. Uh, but you know they get a lot of benefits so rather than allowing a cheap flood of of imports to come in which will basically flood out our growers i think that whatever has been the outcome is something we're very comfortable with uh duties are coming down and will come down on the more expensive wines so you're likely to see something that was at four thousand rupees come down to three thousand rupees that is that's a big reduction in terms of wines that are already at 1500 coming down below a thousand rupees we don't see that at this point um it could happen you know i have no answer for that you know what happens if the government tomorrow decides to reduce the the duties on cars for example from 150 percent down to 50 percent it could happen but i don't see you asking uh maruti etc what will happen in that case um i'm not sure why you know such pointed questions towards uh wine mm. Okay, let's talk about this competition issue in a, in a different light because while you are a dominant player, uh, there are niche labels which are cropping up in various parts. I mean, you mentioned Goa earlier, there are some niche wines in Goa. And you made an interesting move a couple of years ago by buying the uh, wine unit of York. How has that worked out for Sula and do you see the inorganic space as an opportunity in the years ahead? I mean, of course, you'll continue to launch your own brands. But could you potentially be buying some of these niche, smaller labels which are coming up? So Goa is a very interesting uh, case in point. Uh, Goa has, as you said, a proliferation of smaller labels, especially imports. Um, and in fact, you have a lot of imported wine in the price point, exactly the price point that you talked about because of low state duties at 800, 900, 1000 rupees. In fact, as low as 700 rupees. Sula has just had one of its best years ever in Goa, um, I think probably grew by something like 30 percent uh, over the past year in Goa. So, you know, um, great tourism season for Goa. Of course, it's been mainly driven by uh, domestic tourists, which has lifted all boats. But we have proven that today the Indian consumer sees Sula as a go to wine brand. Plus, given our unmatched distribution at the end of the day, an increase in wine drinking means that we emerge as a clear winner. So that's something about Goa and imports. In terms of acquisitions, I would say that we are always open. We are always on the lookout. It's not a very target rich space in terms of other Indian wineries, but for sure, uh, today we're a listed company. That means our, our shares are currency. And um, it's something that we're always open to discussions on. If it makes sense for the seller as well as ourselves, we're always open to that. Uh, has the York thing worked out? I mean, I just want to understand whether as a blueprint, uh, did that ex experience make you more hopeful and optimistic about uh, the inorganic possibilities? So York is a very special uh, circumstance. Their winery and tourism operation is just down the road from our iconic uh, Nasik operation, which is possibly the world's most visited vineyard. So we saw synergies, not just from the um, owning of the brand and distributing the brand, but also from the tourism, because we have such a well-developed tourism. We really know our, our business there. So I would say that, um, yes, uh, it has worked out, probably not exactly as we had expected, but uh, it's definitely worked out. But to find another acquisition exactly like York is not going to be that uh, easy. But definitely we remain open to, to inorganic. So our experience has been pretty good. You spoke about uh, wine tourism. I, I want to understand, Rajiv, what kind of 
revenue potential this business has going forward because today while it is a very handy contributor to your top line uh, the bulk of revenue still is very much the wine business is that going to change is tourism potentially a much bigger percentage contributor of your revenue line so this past year has been just uh, amazing for our wine tourism business I'm sure you saw our Q3 numbers and that gave some sort of idea about, uh, you know, the kind of growth that we've seen. Um, there are two things here in terms of wine tourism. One is the the revenue that it brings, which is, of course, important for um, our overall uh, business. But what is even more important is the fact that at our estates, this is where so many Indians get their first taste of wine. They learn the basics of wine. Wine gets demystified for them, simplified for them, and they leave from our estate being, you know, someone so much more knowledgeable, able to buy wine, understanding the kind of wine that they want to drink, and which is uh, very often one of our wines. And this has been, uh, you know, a terrific experience. So, you know, just to put it in perspective, our individual tastings at our vineyards have gone up by something like 60% in this past year more than 60 percent in this past year over the year before and that's really my aim that when you enter our vineyards you do a tasting you know in half an hour you emerge from there being a brand ambassador for wine and for sula and that is continues to grow by leaps and bounds today nasik and shirdi are connected by air to delhi bangalore hyderabad Nagpur, Ahmedabad, and I'm sorry if I've missed out some, which wasn't the case three or four years ago. So more and more people landing up, hotels still full on the weekends, even though we add more rooms and everybody who comes in gets a taste of the wine life, gets a taste of the Sula life. That's what we're looking for. The, the percentage of revenue to, to me is a little bit less material than how many people we do tastings with and they leave as our brand ambassadors. Mm. Tell me a little bit about uh, the profitability metric of uh, this business, uh, Rajiv. I mean, if you put your wine business and the wine tourism business together, steady state in a year without disruption, I mean, I'm not talking about exceptional years like co uh, COVID, etc. Can it be a 30% EBITDA margin steady state business? So, um, here you're really pulling me, pulling me uh, out. Um, you are aware that we closed uh, last year FY22 uh, um, at approximately a 26% EBITDA margin, which was uh, in incredibly strong already. I am not actually going to project that we're going to uh, head towards 30%, but I would not disagree with you that if you took these two businesses and stripped out our third party brands, actually margins do start tending towards that level. So yes, um, these are strong, profitable businesses. Today, we've become masters of, of producing uh, good quality wine at a, at a very uh, at a very decent price um, and uh, doing that with uh, ever lower and lower uh, manufacturing costs on a per unit basis. Um, so, you know, we do aim to at this point, we're not a low cost producer when you look out at the world but we're becoming a lower and lower cost producer. So it's it's very exciting. Margins are going up all the time. And uh, Udayan looks like you've been doing some of your own uh, financial math uh, behind the scenes. Mm. Uh, where is the real growth coming in from, Rajiv? I mean, is it, I mean, your focus has always been, I mean, your stronghold too has been the elite and premium end of the business. I mean, is your uh, foray into the lower end wines only a matter of expanding the category so that people get a sense of wine and slowly start graduating up the rung, up the value rung? Uh, and do you see elite and premium really as the major growth driver for you in the years to come? So I would say first and foremost, the growth driver is our own brands. That's, that's the first thing, um, you know, three years ago, our uh, third party brands or imported brands or something like 20% of revenues today, it's gone down to less than 10%, less than 8% of revenues. So clearly own brands is where we are focusing and we're doing that really well. Within own brands, our focus is very much premium and elite. Having said that, ultimately we're in India, there is a fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. And, you know, being the largest player, we cannot ignore that segment. And definitely, as you say, people, up, you know, taking people on the rung and bringing them up, etc. Also, the fact being we are the masters of wine, we are the masters of making um, great tasting 
Alcobev out of the grip. And therefore, we want to do that at every price point. And as you're aware, today, Sula dominates every price point, starting at around 250 rupees in Maharashtra, going up to 2,000 rupees for our own brands. Um, sometimes you have one category growing faster than the other. But I'm very happy to say that elite and premium over the last five years have very much outgrown the what we call the economy and popular segments. Um, and today is a much larger percentage of our own brands business. So own brands is the focus. And within that, yes, elite and premium. Um, do we want to continue creating that ladder? Look, the lowest rung, you know, below 500 uh, bucks a bottle is extremely competitive, hyper competitive and characterized by heavy discounting. So it's not necessarily um, the, the uh, slab that we want to play in. We want to play in the more rarefied slabs where our USP is to make a wine that can be on the shelf of a Marks & Spencer or a Waitrose or a Costco across the globe. And today we're giving it to the Indian consumer at a great price. That's where we would prefer to play in that premium and elite range above 700 rupees. Right. Wines of which geographical region appeal to you the most personally, Rajiv? I mean, what, what do you consider aspirational for Sula? I mean, if I were to ask you, does Sula aspire to be producing wines of the quality of a traditional strong Claire like France? Or is it a, a world of new wines like New Zealand or even California where you cut your teeth in, uh, in education and perhaps even picked up your love for wines? Which regions do you think produce the kind of wines which Sula aspires to be over time? So, I mean, that is, of course, we have also come a long way ourselves in Nasik today and we have, you know, a taste of our own. Now, our winemaker, when we started, Kerry Damsky, the guy who was really my winemaking mentor, himself was from Napa and Sonoma. So that was our earliest model. Today, if you look at it, each one of our wines, I would say the model is slightly different. You know, for, for Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand is the model today. Um, for, for some of our red uh, uh, wines, probably the, the Ron region, the southern Ron region of um, France, where you have brands like, uh, or, you know, uh, appellations like Chateau Neuf du Pape, those are something because that's where the world's uh, great Syrahs come from. Um, for Zinfandel, it's California. So it really depends on, on which wine you're talking about. But in all of those cases, I think we, we continue to move up the quality charts. We're winning awards at uh, reputed, um, you know, award shows uh, globally. Uh, but we are always, always tasting those wines. But, uh, personally, I would say that I mostly drink French when I'm not drinking uh, my own wines. Well, on that note, I shall thank you, Rajiv. And, and I look forward to raising a glass to your continued success at Sula in the years to come. Thank you very much for Great. your time. The next today. interview will be in Nasik Udayan. I look forward to that. Cheers. If you like the video, do like, comment, share and subscribe.